So the first thing is, it's just like you have exam technique, show you're working in an exam. So in an interview, you have to show your thinking. Uh, and that's actually both uh, variations of the homophone, your. So show that you are thinking and also show that what you're thinking is. So in other words, you could be having fantastic thoughts, but if you're not speaking them out loud in the context of the interview, then the interviewer has no idea if you've mentally gone to sleep, if you're constructing a shopping list, or if you're thinking incredible profound thoughts. So you have to speak out loud what it is that you're thinking, even if you then realize it's wrong, because you can then say, oh, but that won't work because, and that's the whole point of the interview question. For some interview questions, yes, there is a right answer and they're looking to see if you can get to it. But then as you're being stretched, either it might be that there isn't a single right answer or you're not expected to get to the right answer in one go. And the only way that you could would be if by chance you've heard that question before, because they want to see the way that you break a problem down into steps and how you tackle those. So that's my first piece of advice for like answering or acing uh, an interview question. The second piece of advice is because very often, quite understandably, people are nervous when they're there. And I remember that I was for my interviews. However, a trick that was taught to me, and so I pass on to my students, and there are all sorts of things that people say. Many of them involve imagining the interviewers like at the end of the day going home and doing the washing up. That didn't really work for me. What did work for me was to try and flip things around. So in the interview, yes, it is a socially awkward, constructed, artificial scenario. So everyone's going to feel a bit peculiar about it. However, what they're doing is not so much that they're asking you questions about what's the right answer. If you think about it, what they are doing is saying, what do you think about this scenario, this problem, this question? What do you think on this particular topic? And you've now got two advantages. Advantage number one is that you are the world's leading expert on the matter of what do you think? Because nobody else knows better than you what you think. So you have people who, for a moment, are asking you to speak on the subject about which you know best. To like my little trick for how to try and ace an interview question uh, is to think again, is to think how lucky you are. Ordinarily in conversation, I want to speak a lot of the time. And I know that I can't do that because after a while, people will get very bored of me and will just move away and refuse to have conversations with me. So you have to have this kind of quid pro quo. You have to give and to take. So sometimes you're allowed to inject into the conversation, but then you have to allow other people to do it as well. But in the course of an interview, suddenly you have got one, two, maybe three people. And the convention is, is that they're going to say something to you and then they're going to stop and let you speak and say what you think and they will listen to you. And that's unusual. If you think about your conversations in everyday life with your friends, quite often you kind of have to raise your voice or speak faster to make sure that people will stop and listen to you because they've got their own things to do and their own things to say. Suddenly in the interview, people are going to give you that respect, that time and space for you to be able to say what you think. Now, I know sometimes that can be a bit nerve wracking, but if you can just flip your thinking about it and go, wow, normally I have to fight to get a word in edgeways with some of my friends. And now suddenly the floor is given to me. I'm able to say what I think and people will let me do that without interrupting. That's quite nice. So, um, not all mathematicians have amazing writing skills. This is, this is definitely true. Um, I think, um, I think with all personal statements, um, you do have to remember the, uh, the the first word in that is personal. So um, I think with a subject like maths, where you can talk about having studied maths for an awful long time already, uh, by the time you're applying for university, um, it's it's a, it's appropriate to talk about um, how how much you like the subject uh, and what think you think makes you good at the subject. Um, so I think there's that's the really two aspects you're looking for in your personal statement. There should be, if you're applying to maths because you want to do maths, there should be plenty of things you can talk about that are examples of when you've come across something or uh, you read something or you watched something where it was talking about some mathematical thing that interested you. Um, if you can't think of those examples, you're probably not applying for the right subject. So. Um, I remember in my own personal statement, I spoke about how 
when I was um, quite a relatively young child, I used to like making train timetables for myself, uh, which is a very weird and very geeky thing to want to do. But uh, it, it is actually something that's quite a, quite a mathematical thing. Um, and uh, it's demonstrated, you know, I like just doing maths um, for itself. I don't have a uh, sort of, oh, I, I like doing maths because, oh, it's useful to do this in physics or this in economics or stuff. Um, and it's okay if you want to talk about those things. Absolutely, it's okay to talk about, oh, you know, maths feeds into the sciences. But equally, um, particularly if you end up being a pure mathematician, you're likely just to enjoy maths for its own sake. And um, so you should have, given that it is a subject that, you know, you have a pretty high familiarity with compared to if you were applying for uh, medicine or law, maybe or engineering even, where um, in terms of what you've seen in school, you probably haven't seen that much, which is directly related to those subjects. Uh, for maths, you have seen plenty in school, um, but you've also, you know, we're supposed to maths all around us all the time. So you should have if you're interested in maths, you should have examples you can talk about which are uh, sort of showing why you're interested, sort of demonstrating that interest. Um, you know, what, what kind of things have piqued your interest? What have uh, you thought about that's mathematical beforehand? And as I try to demonstrate by an example there, it doesn't matter if, if, if it's not something you necessarily share with your friends because it's, oh, it's a bit geeky, it's a bit weird. Um, don't, don't worry about that because um, you know, the people who are reading your personal statement are maths tutors. They probably have similar kinds of interests, and similar kind of um, just just that thing of, of enjoying doing maths for its own sake. Um, so that's definitely one part of the personal statement. And you need to make sure that you you can demonstrate your enthusiasm for the subject. But you also need to talk about why sort of why you would be a good student of that subject at uh, at degree level. And that's um, obviously uh, for many of the people at OIC, but uh, more generally, many mathematicians would have things like Maths Challenge that they've been involved in, other competitions and that kind of thing. And absolutely, there's a place for those in your personal statement, but you don't want it to just be, um, here's a thing I did, here's a thing I did, here's a thing I did. Uh, it doesn't really bring that together. So I would say um, you also need to think about what you think makes somebody good at maths. And that might be things that you've already identified yourself that help you, the skills that you have that help you to do uh, A-level or maths or further maths. Uh, it might be things that you observe in, in, in fact, your teachers. It might be things that you've observed from reading books. Um, there's uh, quite a famous maths book called Fermat's Last Theorem, which is on our suggested reading list. Um, that you may have read, um, other maths books are similar. Uh, they quite often actually talk a little bit about the process of doing mathematics and how um, that works for a, uh, a professional mathematician. Um, and so in reading those books, you might realize, oh, well, hang on, I didn't really think about this before, but, but maths, uh, or people who go on to study maths, um, they, they have these kind of qualities. And yes, I do have these qualities. So um, so I suppose you're, you're trying to demonstrate uh, that a you have some understanding of what qualities a mathematician has and i'm deliberately being very, quite vague about what those qualities are because i do think that that's something you need to think about for yourself before uh, finishing off your personal statement um but but um i think you um you should think about what qualities you think a mathematician should have write about that in your personal statement write about why, what could, sort of gave you that indication oh i read this book or i saw this talk and this person was talking about this and this or they demonstrated these qualities and then try and talk about how you demonstrate those qualities and yes absolutely that might be from a maths challenge competition or other maths competition but equally it might be that you can demonstrate some of those qualities in other things that you've done where um, obviously other supercurricular things uh, maybe even extracurricular things. Um, and so uh, you're trying always to tie up this, what skills do I think are needed for a mathematician? Obviously, ability in maths is one of them, but there are other things. Um, and how do you demonstrate that skill? What do you have that's going to make you successful when you get to university? So two halves of your personal statement. Firstly, demonstrate your, your hopeful love of the subject. Uh, and then secondly, uh, trying to demonstrate how you would be good at the subject.
Well, I would say the most important thing to, well, a very useful bit of advice is to take your time, give yourself a chance to think, because some students will rush into an answer. Um, so give yourself at least a few seconds to start thinking, but don't sit there in complete silence. What you should then, what you should do once you started thinking, once you started a thought process, then talk out loud to the people interviewing you, so they can, so you can take them through what your thought process is, so they can see your thinking of an answer. And then, if you go down an avenue and it's not quite right, but you've you, you, you've started maybe in the right direction, but then you've gone off at the wrong, as a tangent. They can then ask you another question and bring you back to where you want to be. But if you're just in complete silence, they don't know whether you're thinking of anything. And if you just say, well, sorry, I can't answer that question, then that's clearly a fail on the question as far as they're concerned. Whereas if you went part way through the answer, uh, showing them what you were thinking, then they can see the thought processes there. And that's what they're, that's what they're looking for in an interview. And they will inevitably, if you answer questions, a couple of quite difficult questions very well, they'll ask you a more difficult question, then a more difficult question, because they're trying to see how far they can push you. So I've had, I've had students come back from interview at uh, pre other schools um, who said, even if they make me an offer, I won't go there now. They were so horrible at interview. And what it was, and you say to them, well, actually, if they were being aggressive with you and pushy with you, it's probably because they could see you could think, and they were pushing you and pushing you and pushing you, and they wanted to see just how good you were. Whereas if they find at the beginning of an interview that you're not actually, don't seem to have the thought processes there to answer, they will interview you for the, for the set amount of time, be very politely, but they won't push you. So they can see you're not going anywhere. So if your interview feels quite nice, it's often a sign that they don't like you, or they don't like your mind. I have to advise students at girls is that you see there will be a lot of obstacles. Just never give up. Go with your passion, and uh, if you are really interested in something, you will excel in it. Right? Never think that you have. Uh, oh, like, like my girls, that like I've told my own girls is that, uh, if you enjoy something, it won't be a chore. It will be a hobby. You will excel in it, and nothing will stop you from wherever you want to go after that. So. My advice to those is that if you're passionate, you enjoy that subject, go for it. You will find obstacle. A lot of people, once even go after the next stage, they will look at you and just say, nope, you're not suitable for it. But never give up your dream. That is the only thing that I tell Eric. That never give up on your dream because if you give up, there's no, no point of living. But there's one thing too. That, you know, if you dream and dream big, so that you keep on trying, keep on going forward, and uh, and never, never give up. That's the thing. Just keep on persevering.